Alright, um, okay, I want to first of all start off just by saying the, there's a purpose even in the title for this workshop. It is uh, the key word in the first one is brothers. I, I feel like we've, we're in a season, uh, we've, we've been in a season in the church for quite a while, in Christianity in America, where we've really lost the concept of what it means to be brothers in the Lord. To, to just regardless of your background, your circumstance, your situations, understanding that that the blood in all of our veins is royal. It's Christ if we're believers, and that that makes us brothers. So that that means we need to learn how to care about each other, especially inside of our churches and inside your other Christian circles that you may have. Is just just really having that understanding that this is my brother, and getting back to that idea that if you've got a problem, I've got a problem. And that's something in America that we've really lost, that the church particularly needs to gain back. And then those of us inside the church that are serious disciples of the Lord really need to take this brotherhood concept in, on a serious level because I think we're accountable for it. I think it's very real. Um, the, the second word, the key word in the title is battle. I, I don't know if you've looked around or read the news lately, but we are in a spiritual war. We're in a battle. And there's a lot of things going on in the culture, and I'm not even talking, you know, politically or not politically, that are go that's going on, that's happening in our culture, that we as Christians are responsible for our actions in. And so, if you're really serious about being in a spiritual battle, you need brothers. And if you're really serious about being brothers, you're going to realize you're in a battle. These things go together. And so, what we're going to talk about is how using the development of men's small groups helps us develop brotherhood, also helps us battle, learn how to battle, which is part of what we're accountable for. Um, Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Let me read that for you. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Um, Part of what we're going to talk about this next little bit is, uh, is just why. We're going to answer the question of why. Why are we talking about small groups? Why would we be interested in developing small groups? So let me give you a little bit of background that just helps us understand this concept of what's going on in this passage right here. A lot of us would ask the question, why would Jesus walk down the beach, look at these two guys, say, come follow me, why would they leave their career and their dad just because this guy said, come follow me? It's because he's got he's Jesus and he's got this trance thing over them. What was that about? And I think it's really important that we understand that back then you had you had rabbis who would who would uh, come on in guys if there's is there a chair back there? Um, that you would have you would have a rabbi who would tell men of the age of accountability, you know, 12, 13 years old, they'd bring these young men in and they would say, okay, you need to know the Torah, you need to know the, you need to know the context of the Torah. And so what they would do is they would bring young men in and they, they would say, okay, quote me Deuteronomy 4, this much of the passage. The young man would have to do it. Then, then, then the rabbi might say, Okay, what is the context? What is the meaning in and around this passage? They had to learn how to not just throw up memorize scripture. They had to really learn how to work with the word and understand the word and have a meaning of what does this mean? Okay? So to, to get to the point where they could even teach it. So what would happen was these rabbis would have these young men, they'd come in, ask them to quote scripture, ask them to give context, ask them questions in and around scripture. If they didn't handle that properly, then what the rabbi would do is say, didn't, didn't go well for you, go find a career. Go do something else. You need to find a trade. If they handled the scripture well, they handled the Torah well, what would happen was the rabbi would say, come and follow me. Which means, come and be my disciple. Come in and you're going to live with me. I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to train you in the ways of the rabbi. Okay? So you got to understand here that Peter and Andrew had flunked the original rabbi test. Okay? And they knew they had. That's why they were fishermen. That's why they worked for dad. And so Jesus 
had shown the capability of handling the word well when he was a child. Remember the story? It was first came find and they find him in the temple and they were amazed at the ability to teach. So he had gained a reputation of being a rabbi that just blew it off the charts. Of course, a lot of people didn't understand. He was the word and he had written the word, so therefore he knew everything about the word. And He's all about me. Yeah, he was very qualified. And so they knew that. So they knew he had a great reputation as a rabbi. So here's this rabbi with this incredible reputation, walks down the beach. Look at these two fishermen that flunked the original rabbi test and goes, come and follow me. That was a huge meaning to that mm -hmm. to them. It wasn't just a suggestion or a, hey, you guys look good. It wasn't like picking for basketball. You know, we're talking about a major thing. So that's why they dropped their nets and they followed him. But I think it's very interesting, and, and this, this ties into what we're talking about, that Jesus... Now, sometimes in Scripture, we've not just got to look at what happened. We need to look at what didn't happen. Jesus didn't walk into the temple and start picking guys. He walked down a beach. He looked at boats. He looked at tax collectors. He looked at everyday, ordinary, common guys and called them. Okay? That's really key that we understand that because he was God. He could have chosen whoever he wanted. If he wanted a king to be his disciple, I think God could pull that off, Right? If he's sovereign, if he's almighty God, he can do that. That's not what he did. And I think it's also critical that we understand that when Jesus began calling his disciples in a very short span of time, if he was God, so if he wanted to, he could have walked down a beach, and at the end of that walk, he could have had 12,000 guys. Like, what they wanted him to do was overthrow the government, be the Messiah on the white horse and overthrow the Roman government, he could have called an army and done that. <clears throat> he could have called 12,000 guys. He could have called 1,200 guys. He could have called 120 guys. But isn't it interesting? They called just 12. Now, let's tie that into how we tend to be trained to think in the American Western church. What does the focus tend to be when we talk about church? Size. Size. Numbers. <coughs> quantity. How big is your building? How many people do you have? Um, I, I told the last group that uh, for nine years I, we planted we planted three churches actually over a period of time. But one of them I pastored for nine years, and when I would meet other pastors, and they would find out that I pastored a church, you know what their first their next question always was? How many? How, big how, many, how many do you have? And I got so tired of that question because to me that's got nothing to do with it. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's why God would, did give me 4,000 members because I'd go, 4,000. <laughs> How many do you have? Maybe I would have been really egotistical. I don't know. You know, maybe He protected me from that. You know, we had about 150. But here's what I started doing. I started, st I, did, I would not answer the numerical number because I talked about my members. I talked about who I had, not how many I had. And I think that's more the concept of what we learned from Jesus. And what's something I decided to do is what we see from Jesus. Um, think about this for a minute, guys. Um, there's no place in Scripture, or, or we have no indication that, that this happened, but it could have. So Jesus has called his disciples. He called 12. You know, the 12th one is a little sketchy, and it turned out to be, it was true that he was sketchy. But so he's got 12. And then he had, you know, ended up with Mary and Martha and a few others, but his primary were 12. Just think about the teachers of the law when they find out that he's got these picked these 12 guys who aren't rabbi material, okay? And they come up to him and go, well, Jesus, we see you've kind of chosen your church. How many do you have coming? And Jesus didn't go, well, we've got 12, but, you know, we, we're planning a huge men's outreach next week, and we're going to do a fish fry out by the lake, and we're going to have a loop band play, and we're hoping to get up to 40 or 50 next week. You know, that is not what he said. <clears throat> That was not his answer. And here's the thing. we got to remember, Jesus didn't apologize for anything of that nature because it was intentional what he did. And I think we've got to follow that line of thinking when we start thinking about men's ministry and, and what our focus is and how we're going to focus. Um, because the most disappointing thing for anybody who's a men's event is when they see they're not going to get the number that they thought or hoped or prayed they would get. It happens all the time. It's part of it. It's how it's how we're wired, and I get it. And, I, and as soon as somebody asks me to come into a men's event, 
I immediately start helping the leader understand like, man, you pray for your number and I'm believing for you. Brother, I'm here for you no matter how many you so up. Because it just, I've been there, you know, I've seen that too many times. But I think it's really important that we understand Jesus made the decision as God, think about that, as God, I'm going to call only 12 guys. Just 12. And then what I'm going to do is inside that 12, as they get to know me, because he already knew them because he created them, remember? I'm going to pull three out for a little extra training. And then after I get to, they get to know me more, I'm going, to, I'm going to really pour a lot into one. So Jesus had 12. And inside the 12, he had a three. And inside the three, he had a one. Because in Peter, he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And he's like, mate, what? And that's how we would think likely too, just like Peter did. Okay, So, I think it's important as, for, as, as men, when we start to think about men's ministry, that we focus on who we have and not how many we have. We think about how deep are we going, not how many are showing up for pancakes. Okay, Get our eyes on the right thing and on the right focus. That's, that's a huge, huge part of, of getting our hands and our, and, our, and our heart and our minds in the right places. So, um, in Matthew 12, 49, it says, Then Jesus pointed to His disciples and said, These are My brothers. Now, isn't that a cool statement? He could have called them anything He wanted, and it would have been mine. He could have called them whatever He wanted, but He called them brothers because He was living His life with them. And that's, again, why we, have to, we can't just pass off this brotherhood idea. It's really, really important. So, um, we have to stop thinking in, in measurement of numbers and start thinking about quality and quantity and depth because Jesus never apologized for having 12. So um, if we're going to think about men's ministry, we need to think about this simple thing. A men's ministry is to do just one thing, and that's reach men. It's reach men. And, and let God drive that and energize that. So that's kind of some of the why. I want to move into the what. Like, what do we do in a men's ministry? What would he do if we develop a small group ministry? The first thing we need to do is every small group just needs to focus on two things. Your men's ministry needs to reach men, but your small groups need to do just two things. And if you ever start doing anything outside of those two things, you're getting, you're getting off track and you're doing too much. Here's the two things. One is spiritual growth. We, we do men's ministry, we do men's small groups for spiritual growth. Um, and we had a conversation in the last group about the difference between biblical growth and spiritual growth. Well, if you, if you really begin to study the Word, read the Word, take in the Word, with your group of guys or inside your men's ministry, you're going to grow biblically in your understanding. You're also going to then grow spiritually because we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, which is the Word of God. Okay? So, spiritual growth is number one. Second is moral protection. Guys, we know we got stuff coming at us that's difficult to deal with, and all of us have our issues. You may have some different than me and me different than you. We may have some that are common, but we have our issues. So what we need to do is I need to grow more into the image of Jesus, but then you and I need to protect each other from the things coming at us that can hurt us. Okay? Now, think about it. Think about spiritual growth and think about moral protection in this. Let's put it in guy language. Offense and defense. Okay? Offense is spiritual growth. Defense is moral protection. You know, whatever team and whatever sport you want to talk about, you have an amazing offense but a really crappy defense. Guess what? Doesn't guarantee a win, right? Yeah. Flip it. Incredible defense. Bad quarterback, bad running back. It's going to be hard to win. Okay? So you want to balance that and have both. So if you and I are getting together and going, we're going to challenge and inspire each other to grow in the image of Christ, but then we're going to really dig in deep and learn what's hurting you, what's affecting you, what's stopping your relationship from Christ from growing. We want to attack that too. That's offense and defense. It's spiritual growth and moral protection. All of that's going to converge into life change. I said it in front of everybody, but I'm going to repeat it here again. I really honestly believe that the primary thing God can use to change a man is a godly woman, okay? 
Um, and I know that, that there's, you know, not everybody's married. I know not everybody, everybody's people have been divorced, and I get all that, so does that. But here's the other thing that can help us grow, whether we're married or not, and that if we will truly allow our lives to be transparent with two or three other guys and really be honest about what's going on in our lives spiritually and what's happening in our lives as sin, that's going to change us. Um, Far more than just making sure that we're attending church because we're going deep with someone on a regular basis. Okay, um, let me pass out. This is something you can just take home for a, for a reference. You can just well, you said uh, those around. transparent with three or four other guys. <coughs> What's the upper limit of that? Let me get to that. Okay. Uh, hang right there. If I don't, remind me. But I think we'll get to that. Okay. Um, let me just run through this for a second. And I know you're still... You're handing those out. This is just something I want to give you, something that's a take home. It's just a reminder of what we're trying to do and accomplish in men's ministry. First of all, when you're trying to deal with, with the starting anything for men, you always need to think campfire. You need to be more school. It's a good problem to have. Can you hand those back to there? You need more too? Here, would you guys hand these back to them? There you go. <coughs> you got enough? We good? <coughs> Alright, okay. Okay, always think campfire. Don't think church service. Don't think classroom. Think campfire. When you're talking about men's ministry, you have that concept, that idea. Guys camping out, guys gathering around a fire. That's where some deep talks can happen, right? When you're in that kind of environment, so many you think. I was telling, telling the last group, think about what we do in our churches. In our classroom settings, we do tile floors and fluorescent lights. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and so and so what is this what is this kind of like? A hospital room, right? Sterile. Yeah, it's a sterile environment. If you get guys around a campfire, something can happen. Because so that's an important thing. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but so think campfire. Our goal is always to create a Christ centered band of brothers. We've covered that, and I just want to put that on your handout. Here's some focal points. You want people, you want brothers who are gonna watch your back and kick your butt. Now, let's be real. Mm -hmm. If, if you're going to allow somebody to call you out on something and you're going to allow it to happen and listen to them, it's going to have to be somebody that you know has got your back, right? And that's part of brotherhood. It's a, it's a balance. It's both. We need to build on the Bible and have a bridge to God's presence. So Scripture always needs to be a part of every men's ministry and every small group and trying to get to God's presence. Change behavior and bring balance. Remove barriers and install boundaries. Now, the enemy is constantly trying to put barriers in our life between God and relationships. But God can install boundaries that's going to help us in staying away from the things that are going to hurt us. So we need to remove barriers and install boundaries. Next is reduce blind spots and maximize belief. We've all got blind spots. We've got stuff we just cannot see we do. All right? Um, my 24-year-old the other day goes, um, hey, Dad, can I talk to you about something? And I was like, sure, buddy, what's going on? He's like, he talked to me about a blind spot that I had. That's something I didn't realize I was doing. You know, and thank God I created an environment that he's okay with bringing me that, you know. But I, I welcome that from him because he loves me, all right? Now, then we battle together and we grow brotherhood. And then this is a great, great line for all men's ministry is bring broken men to brave action. Because the first thing we've got to realize in a men's small group is we are all broken. Okay? We've all got our stuff. We've all got our issues. And God knows that, so we need to realize it. But we all need to be brave about addressing and trying to deal with those. Alright? So, now I'm going to move to, this is really logistical stuff, but it's important. Alright? I'm going to give you three aces. It's place, space, and grace. Place, space, and grace. Let me explain those. Number one, the place is wherever you're going to meet, whether you're going to just have a small group to meet or you're going to try to do men's ministry in your church, you need to have a place that's comfortable for guys. 
Now, I'm not talking about soft sofas and, you know, Starbucks. I'm talking about a place where they feel safe to share. Um, I just said Starbucks. Let's say you can't have an effective men's small group meeting at Starbucks because who's going to talk about a pornography addiction around a bunch of people? You know, you're just not going to do that, especially if you're in your, t in your town. You, so you've got to have a place where you feel free to share, somewhere you're comfortable with sharing. Um, and, and the feel is very important of that, of, of people that, of having a place where people feel comfortable that they can share. So, the place you meet is really important, all right? Um, the next one is space. Now, place and space can seem like the same thing, but here's what I'm talking about with space. We've got to learn, once again, the discipline of silence. We've got to understand that silence is okay when we're trying to grow and we're trying to deal with stuff. Case in point, all of us have been in Sunday school classes. When a Sunday school teacher is in front of a group and he's trying to engage discussion, what does a Sunday school teacher feel like is his enemy? Silence. Silence. Yeah. You ask a question and you step back and the, the Sunday school teacher is going, oh God, please, please, please somebody let somebody say, say something. Say something. Work with me. Yeah, and then and you're looking at one of your buddies going, dude, if you're quiet for another minute, like, man, we are, you know, we're going out of the hall after this because you want people to talk because of your role, right? But we've got to learn to embrace silence because particularly as guys, let's forget the ladies right now, as guys, here's what can happen. I ask you a question right now. And you're, what are you going to first start doing? You're going to start thinking. Processing. processing. You need a minute to do that. Now, if you come up with something, what's going to happen next is, for a lot of you, you're going to have to work up the courage to say it. Right? Okay, I know what I want to say. I'd like to say it. But what if right before you finally got the courage and the answer, I go, okay, well, it's nobody's going to share, so you like, whew, dodge the bullet, Right? <laughs> So in men's ministry and in small groups, what we got to do is quiet is okay. And when I was a pastor, uh, once a quarter, I would do open mic day. And after worship, I just put a mic, live mic, up in the front of the room, and I sit down. And if you if you've got any sort of testimony of anything that the Lord's done, something that's happened to you, something you need prayer for, it's open mic to the church. You can share it. And it was always some of our most incredible services just to give people the opportunity to share what God has done. An amazing concept for the church, right? It's just share what God's done. And so, um, but here's what would happen all the time. When I would do that, I would, I would sit down and four or five people were ready. You know, they were coming up and they were sharing. And then they would have a lull. And, you know, and when you're sitting there in a church and it's been one minute since nobody's come up there, that feels like forever. <laughs> and so I'd go by, you know, and I'd let, I'd let a couple of minutes or so go. Sometimes I'd let three. And I'd kind of be looking around watching people, because we weren't a huge church, watching people, and, uh, and looking around like, okay, I guess that's it. And all the time, I would start to step up and somebody would stand up. Well, what if I'd have jumped it at two minutes? What if I'd have jumped it at one minute yeah. and shut it down? So, particularly as guys, we've got to think, we've got to process. Even if you're an extrovert, we can be uncomfortable sometimes in sharing. We've got to encourage the space for guys to think and process and, and, to, and to form their answers and to speak. That's really, really important. So, as leaders, we've got to stop the temptation to talk in the gaps. And uh, another thing about space is... We've also got to watch in men's ministry when people are sharing, and in small groups, when guys are sharing, we've got to peg how many extroverts do we have in the group, how many introverts do we have in the group, because that makes a big difference. Okay? Case in point, the church where I was pastor, um, we had five elders, of which I was one, and so I, I realized about after about two or three meetings after we'd formed the elders of our church, I had two extroverts and I had two introverts. So what would start to happen in our meetings is, 80% of what was shared were from the extroverts. And the two introvert guys did a lot of this. You know, their personalities were happening. And I was kind of, I'm an introvert by nature, but I'm an extrovert because I'm trying to be a leader. And so I'm kind of working on both ends. But what I finally had to do was I had to finally come together and go, hey guys, I love you. You guys need to shut up a little bit. You guys need to speak up a little bit. We've got to balance this thing. So, 
that personality at, at the part of space, of the line of space, you've got to allow for people's personalities. Okay? Um, all right, the third one is grace. It's grace. Um, I know I'm talking with a broad brush here, very stereotypical, but I think it's important that we understand this. Across denominational lines in the American church, we're coming out of a season, I believe, that's put a lot of grief on the men. You know, we went through a season in the church where uh, it was far more women. Women were making decisions. Women were determining what was going on in the churches. Lots of women were coming and bringing their kids, and dad was gone, or dad was staying at home, absentee dads, and all that kind of thing. And even it started being reflected in our sitcoms. And dad was always the dupe who couldn't do anything right. You know, we've gone through that season in our culture that you see the reflection in the church, you see the reflection in the culture. And so, I think we're coming out of that, though, now. So one of the things we've got to do that's very, very important in men's ministry is we've got to be a place that offers grace. Because we all know, guys, that we do stuff wrong. Me or anybody else doesn't have to get up and remind us, like, just in case you've forgotten what you did last week, let me remind us, you know? We, we can't do that because we've got to understand we're all broken on some level in some ways. Understand that. You may be broken differently than me and me than you, but we're all broken. And so we all need to offer grace. So we've got to not offer each other grief but grace. So any men's ministry, any men's small group needs to be built on grace. Now, can you go too far with that and just let people go, hey, brother, whatever you've done, it's cool. That's not that either. It's a balance. But we've tended to be too much on the other side. And if men, men will come today to a grace-oriented environment when they know they're <coughs> safe, when they know somebody's going to care about them and help them with their stuff, but they won't show up somewhere well, they know they're just going to be, get beat over the head again because everybody else is doing that to them, right? So, that's grace is really, really important that we understand that. Uh, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, if we're believers, then there is no condemnation because we're in Christ. So, we're also not allowed to condemn each other. So, when a brother has the bravery and the guts to sit with another couple of men and go, hey guys, i got to come clean with something I've been doing for far too long. Here it is. Whatever that is, that's bravery, gentlemen. And we've got to stop thinking that somehow, oh, he confessed a sin. We don't need to do that in the church. That's not the attitude we've got to have. The attitude we've got to have is, brother, this is the place to get out your dirty laundry. This is the place to create a safe environment you be able to talk about what's going on because we want to help you change into the image of Christ. And the only way we're going to change the image of Christ is for us to deal with our stuff, right? Because we all want that place of grace. Um, so, the place is important, space is important, and, and grace is important. Now, one last thing about grace is um, you can have a very, very grace-oriented men's ministry leader or pastor or whoever is taking is over things, but then you can have a couple of judgmental members that can run everybody off. So you've got to really be careful as a men's ministry leader to just watch things to realize that somebody, if somebody's constantly like, oh, I can't believe he did that, you know, that kind of stuff, guys are out the door. In fact, that actually usually will tell them church is not a safe place. Yeah. So you're not just affecting you, that your church when that happens or your ministry, you could be affecting their church paradigm for the rest of their lives. Okay, so grace is incredibly important. Okay, um, let me give you a couple of uh, of models of ways to do men's ministry. Now, um, for the, I've been doing men's ministry this uh, going on ten years, where that's been my primary focus of what I do, um, and and that came out of me being a pastor because I realized. If you get to the guy, you can get to the family. Um, and so that's really what, how God kind of called me into this. And it's, it's not an easy thing at all. Men's ministry is tough these days, but that's the motive. But one of the things I've seen is it is, doesn't matter the denomination, doesn't matter whether you have a small church or you have a large church, lots and lots and lots of churches today have nothing to do I mean, I, I can tell you mega churches right now who have a viable, strong women's ministry 
an incredible student ministry, incredible children's ministry, but the men's ministry is not existing. Then here's another thing that we've got to be really careful of, and I'll explain this, but very often men's ministry in churches, they call it men's ministry, but it's an opportunity for men to get together and eat wild game, or throw axes, or go fishing, or go bowling, and nothing spiritual happens. It could have been bowling club, it could have been whatever, but we did it on the auspices of the church is sponsoring this. Now, if you have a men's ministry that's growing and functioning and guys are deepening in the Lord, and then you have those events as an outreach to get guys into your men's ministry, now you've got it right. Now this is what we need to do. There needs to be doorways for men to get in to men's fellowship, but if that's all you're doing, then we're not really doing men's ministry. Okay, So, with that in mind, there's two ways. And, and the way I'm going to tell you to do men's ministry, it doesn't require a pastor to be on board. It doesn't require a budget or a line item from the church. Okay, I'm talking bare bones organic here, right? So, one is, and this is the way I started one in my own church, is just get all the men together that are interested. If you're interested in men's ministry on any level, you want to get together with us as guys from church, <coughs> Come Wednesday night at 7 or whatever it is and gather guys together and then start to just introduce the paradigm of guys we want to grow in the Lord together, we want to be brothers, we want to fight the battle together, we want to help you be a better husband, a better father, a better employee, a better boss, everything. Get the, get the parameters out there of what you're trying to do. And then what we would do is we'd gather everybody together. We would, we would kind of challenge, do a short challenge thing. We'd kind of do an inspirational thing, and then we'd ask, you know, is there any big prayer requests going on that we need to know about from somebody? And then what we do is say, okay, grab a couple of brothers next to you and go split off and go around the building, and you guys just talk about what's going on in your life and pray. When you're done, hang out and visit where you can go. Let me tell you what started happening. We began to get everybody together, got everybody on the same page, telling guys to split off into groups. I'm just talking about understanding you're just sharing life, what's going on in your life right now, and then praying for whatever you shared, we would have guys hanging out in the parking lot until midnight talking about stuff. Only because we created an environment for guys to be able to communicate to one another. Now think about that. If you want to create a men's ministry, if you just allow guys to go, this is a safe place for you to talk to somebody, for you to, for you to pray for each other, that's men's ministry. And guys will show up for that. And guys will stay for that. So we would gather all the guys together and we'd break into small groups. Here's another way you can do it. And I'm going to walk through that model again in a second to teach you how to do this. But if you say, we're going to form small groups, and then every six weeks, eight weeks, whatever you decide, then you get all the guys together. Then you do a fellowship thing. And they don't meet that week. So it's small group focused, but then you get all the guys together to do something. And that's a great time to invite somebody in, like we talked about a few minutes ago. So there's two models. It's big to little or little to big. Now, I know I shared this this morning, and I did it really quickly. But let me walk through this again, just so you understand. I'm going to be a little more detailed this time. But um, this is what I've developed for starting in small groups. Now, here's the beauty of this. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your situation. You can get these two books, and you've got them in your hands, but make sure you have them, to say, you have no excuses now. You can go grab a couple of other guys. You can start a group. Whether your church is on board, no matter who's on board, you can do this. So, if you look in the front of this 3SG book, and by the way, 3SG is just a brand that's from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 11. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So, if a man falls down, who's going to help him up? It's that passage. So, in the front of the book, it basically says, what is a small group? Why do you recommend three? What, is it, what does a group do? Who should I have in my group? What does a meeting look like? What's the point or goal of the meeting? How often should we meet? Where do we meet? What about life in between the meetings? And then there's some added points there. I worked with a lot of different guys to say, have we covered all the basic questions that a guy would ask to start a small group? I think for the most part, we've covered 95% of it here. So you literally can read very simple guidelines on how to start a group and just follow that and you can do it. Now, again, that's week one. 
really simple. You don't even have to turn the page. Like, it's right there. Your next meeting that you have, whether it's a week later or two weeks later, what is it? That's a meeting. So it starts off really easy, really simple. But where the text is going to take you is one, into Scripture, and two, it's going to take you into how do you be in a group? What do you do in a group? So after 13 weeks, you'll get a really good feel of what we're supposed to do when we get together. Now, lastly on this book, this last page has a list of accountability questions. So, you don't have to follow, you don't have to go through all of these every week. You can write your own. Uh, this is just a guideline of how you can form this. But let's just say you start meeting with some guys. You start realizing, well, this guy has a real issue with this. This guy has an issue with this. I have an issue with this. Here's what we're struggling in. You start developing your questions you're going to ask each other to tell each other the truth based on what's going on in everybody's life. A lot of guys get together, and what is the first thing that they're all going to start trying to deal with? Purity, right? And so you start learning what questions do we need to ask each other to help each other start to, to develop purity in our lives and hold to that. So that's the question. Uh, I know one group who their very last question they always ask each other is, did you just lie to me? <laughs> Which is a great question to have at the very end. Did you just lie to me? They ask each other that every week. And when you start meeting with some guys that you really start loving and caring about and praying for, it's, hard to, it's harder and harder to lie. It really is. And so that's a great question. Um, then, after you get out the 3SG book, which is 13 weeks or how many weeks you want to do it, then you move to this book. There's 15 chapters. There's some introductory chapters in it. And then it dives into uh, issues of purity. I talk about pornography. I talk about lust. I talk about masturbation. I talk about all the stuff that we don't want to talk about as guys and we sure don't want to talk about in the church. Okay? I deal with all that stuff from a scriptural basis. All right? It's not just, hey, don't do this or do this. I deal with it from a scriptural basis. So we deal with all those issues of purity. And then we, and then we talk about Speaking truth and not, how do we become a man of truth? And we deal with the lies that we tell ourselves, the lies we tell other people, all those kind of things we deal with, how do I become a man of truth? And then it moves to righting wrongs. Righting the wrongs in my own heart, righting the wrongs in my family and my marriage, righting the wrongs in my community that I can, and even how God can use you in the world. And then the final chapters are dealing with just the nature of following Jesus. And so... Um, I've had groups that, this is about six months of material, if you're going to meet every week, I've had groups finish in six months. I know a group in South Carolina that it took them a year. Because when they were in the purity section, they were like, we're not going to move on until we've all dealt with this. And so if, it, if they spent three months in purity, so be it. Nobody was setting a deadline on it. It's their group, which is the beauty of it. There wasn't some pastor going, hey, when are you guys going to be done and move on? It was, it, was the, it was about dealing with the issues, which is really the point. Okay? Now, um, here is always the big question in men's small groups. And I get this all the time. Well, um, well, Robert, we did your 3SG and we did your knowledge cut. It went really well. It took us six months, nine months, a year, whatever it took us. What book do you recommend next? Well, here's all my, my answer. The Bible. You take, use the Bible. There's scripture in here. All I'm doing with these books, gentlemen, is leading you into how to be in a group and dive into the deep end with your issues and really deal with the stuff. Then what you do when you're done with these, you show up with your heart and your Bible. You sit down with your brothers and you go, here's what's going on, here's what happened this week, here's what's going on. If you, if you ask accountability questions, ask them. Have some sort of basis with how you deal with your stuff. Share. Open the Word and say, what is God showing you in the Word? What is God teaching you? doesn't mean you all got to be reading the same Scripture. If, if He showed me something in Mark and you something in Proverbs, awesome. You know what's going to happen? When you share what God's done with you for you in Proverbs, that's going to challenge me. If I share what God showed me in Mark, that's going to challenge you. It's iron sharpening iron. And so, if it's the Word, it's going to sharpen each other. It's not ever going to return void. You do that and then you pray for one another. So if you make an hour a week with two other brothers, and you share life, you talk about the stuff, you deal with where you are and how you're doing, you talk about the Word and what God's teaching, you pray for one another, that's an hour of your week. Gentlemen, I promise you this. I have never, ever, ever in ten years of this seen a group of guys that are serious about this and do it that they don't grow and their lives don't change. 
Because if you commit to this kind of life, which again, go back to the beginning, this is exactly what Jesus was doing with His disciples. We're just able to do it with one another. And remember, where two or three are gathered, there He will be in our midst. If you're going to get together with your brothers, I promise you Jesus is going to show up too. Especially when you invite Him. So, um, anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of the rundown. I know there's a lot of information thrown at you really fast. And we went from spiritual to logistics. Uh, but, but hope that will help you. I hope that you guys are in here to start a group. You just We put the tools in your hands to be able to do that. And then, uh, and I just want to speak, there's a few younger guys in the room here, and I just want to tell you, there is a whole <coughs> lot of stuff that you're probably already dealing with. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going to be coming at you. If somehow you could get with some guys that were serious about Jesus, and you started on this, the stuff you could avoid down the road will be unbelievable. So, uh, and there's too many guys in here that would say amen to that because we went down the road and we saw the bad stuff because we weren't doing it right. And we, now we know. And we can say that to you. And I know we all got to experience things for ourselves. But man, how I would have loved to have avoided some things had I learned some of this sooner, for sure. But I hope you know how to start a group now. And then if you, if you, if you desire to start a men's ministry in this church, don't complicate it. Keep it simple. Use one of the models that I've told you and you don't need anything. I, I'll, sh I'll stop here and then I'll let you have comments or ask questions because I don't allow for that. Um, this is kind of the state of the church to me of how things are today. I had a lay ministry leader at, at a church. They started, it was the church that started in the 1800s. They had never had a men's ministry, ever. <clears throat> and so they had a men's ministry, and they had a women's ministry, they had a children's ministry, they had a student ministry. And so this lay leader that wanted to do men's ministry got permission from the pastor, brought me in to do my conference where I helped start small groups at the end. And um, so we did all that. And um, so I'm there, and we set up, and we're waiting. You know, guys are showing up before it starts and everything. And the pastor comes in, and the lay leader grabs me and says, I want to introduce you to our pastor. So I met this guy, you know, in his 40s, really nice man. And he said, it's great to meet you, Robert. Can I talk to you out in the hallway for a second? Sure. So I go out in the hallway, and I'm not kidding you. I'm going to tell you literally what happened. He put his finger in my chest, and he goes, don't you do it. Anything this weekend is going to put another thing on my plate. Do you understand? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what he was afraid of was I was going to come in as the guest speaker, declare how you start a men's ministry, and everybody's going to look at the pastor and go, hey, how are we going to do this? And I go, I go, brother, listen, I'm going to put this on the responsibility of your men. Not you. In fact, if this works out the way I think it's going to work out, your life could get a little easier. Because some men may step up to help you. So a month later, I get a picture of 30 guys that started small groups, 10, 10 groups, threes. 30 guys that got together for a get-together on a Saturday to hang out and fellowship because they'd all been meeting together for a while. 30 guys all smiling and meet together. Pastor wasn't there. <laughs> Everybody wins, right? Pastor yeah. was or wasn't? He wasn't, he wasn't there. Oh, was not Yeah. Yeah, so, and that's, there's nothing about the pastor because we got too many guys that are just, they're overworked. Now, I had one guy ask about um, talking about pastors, and I've actually seen a lot of pastors and priests that don't really want a men's ministry to begin because you get a bunch of guys on fire in your church and you've got another thing you're going to have to handle, right? Or they become intimidating or whatever it could be. So, you know, there's a lot of... I was a pastor too, man. I get it. So I'm not speaking about anything that I don't understand too. But it can get interesting, right? So, anybody any questions? Anybody any comments? I had asked earlier and you said uh, how long on that. Yeah. Upper limits on the size of the... Thank you. Very good. Um, the reason I suggest three is... In fact, there's a weird... There's a Chevrolet truck commercial right now that says the power of three. Yeah. yeah. There's something about three. And I go like... You know, how many astronauts were on every Apollo mission? Three. Right. Okay, how many Marx Brothers were there? Three. How many were in ZZ Top? Three. You know? <laughs> how many were in the Holy Trinity? Three. Right? Four okay. Marx Brothers. 
There's three students. Well, uh, <laughs> three students. There you go. You got it. Thank you for correcting me. See? See? You're watching my back and kicking my butt. All right. <laughs> they were this, complete. this is good. Yeah, thank you for that. You're right. Three students. Right, right. So, I just think there's a power to three. I don't understand it. I don't get it, but there is. But here's the practical answer to that, too. Um, I know guys that have four, five, and even six in their group. They have trouble getting everybody in and praying and talking in an hour. So uh, it's a, uh, it's, time, a, it's, time, a, it's a time thing. Okay. Now guys tell me all the time, like, man, there's me and three buddies, just like we're we're tight. And I go, then stay tight. Like, don't change it. Just allow for it. So there's no magic number, and I even address that in the three SG book. I just recommend it if you're starting to do threes, and that's the reason why. Okay. So how do new people coming in get into one of those three groups or they have to start their own group? Yeah, um, well, that's where somebody, whether it's a, a men's ministry leader or a point person, is going to have to pay attention to somebody wanting in. <clears throat> because you're going to have to either... I've seen where, um, you know, a church goes, hey, our men's ministry is growing, we got some guys that want to get in a group, if any of you are interested, let me know, and then you can see if it fits. Um, another one could be, like, you, if you've got a guy coming in, let him... Let him come into a group to learn how to do it. I've actually seen where a guy will come in to a three to make four, and another guy go, you know what, we've been doing this a long time together, let him stay, I'm going to go start another group. You know, you can start multiplying. Because what could happen down the road is the guys that have been meeting together a long time, they get really, they really understand the paradigm, may decide it's time for us to start our own groups and start to multiply and branch out. That's a way to grow the men's ministry organically, too. So. How do you interface with the Mayus groups? <clears throat> well, I mean, I've never personally dealt with that. I've had a lot of guys tell me this is very similar to Mayus groups. Yes. And what's good? And you know, this is not this is not something new under the sun. You know, like I said, Jesus started it when, in, in the beginning of the church. So I don't have any personal experience of how to how that interacts. If this is open to anybody. Anybody. This not is, just not just. Yeah. And, and I tell I, I've had guys say. Hey, I don't know another guy at the church that would do this with me. Who's your Christian buddies? Yeah. Uh, this doesn't have to be even inside your church. Sure. So say you have a group of three and you start meeting together and after a few weeks, one of the people is suddenly only able to be there maybe once a month when you're meeting every week. Do you ask eventually tell that person, listen, I think we need to find another person for the group? Or what do you do? That's such a delicate personal matter right there. That I, I would I would not I would not think there's a a blanket way to deal with that because you can know that okay we need to keep meeting but we got to accommodate him because of what's going on but I just I think that's just where you got to be really sensitive to the Lord and what he's trying to he's trying to tell you to do something else I want to address that that's a that's a it's an important thing is it, sometimes too. You start meeting together, and you just start realizing, like, once somebody in the group will realize, like, this isn't just clicking with me. Like, I'm not, I don't feel like I fit here. That's where you just got to get honest and go, guys, I love you. This isn't a good fit. I mean, I've had to deal with that as a pastor when we started small groups. I have a guy come to me and go, it's, it's just not a fit. And I go to the other two guys and go, hey, man, it's nothing personal, because it's not personal. It's a fit thing. And, like... He's going to go try to find another group. I'm going to kind of help you guys, or if you guys know somebody you want to invite in. And generally, that stuff will work out really well if it's handled sensitively. Sure. So. Anybody else? Oh, rules. Do you have any guidelines in starting the group where you establish what we need to focus on? Because I've been in groups before where they're just talking about their daily life and have nothing to do. Well, that's why a lot of the stuff I taught at the very beginning, it, it's got to be about spiritual growth and moral protection. If you start talking about sports and the weather, that's fine before you start and after you okay, finish. Okay, okay. But you've got to stay focused on those two things. Because, yeah, guys, will we'll, we're notorious for distracting ourselves. <laughs> Talk about anything before yeah. we do. All right. Anybody else? Well, guys, thank you. I mean, you guys have been incredible. It's just so cool that you show up on a Saturday. I want to get this kind of information. Let me let me pray for you, okay? God, for every guy in this room that really just, just desires to get serious about their growth in you and they want to find some guys that start a group, I pray that you would lead them to that. I pray that that would come together well for them and they would they would take what they learned today 
Take the tools and the resources you put in their hands. Help them to find the right guys to be a fit, to, to grow. Father, for the men in the room that they're wanting to start something at their church, they want to develop this more as something uh, in their church, Father, I pray that you would just empower them, you would lead them, because nobody wants to make disciples out of men more than you. So I pray that they just follow you in that, that use these tools and these ideas, these concepts and resources to be able to do that. You'd bless them in that. Pray that every one of these guys would somehow decide to wrap their lives around a couple of other guys for the sake of growing in you so that we can do what we're supposed to do here and that's change the world for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you guys. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you.